Ugh, I cannot believe that we actually have to do this a second fucking time. Oh, this really sucks. Alright, so, spent an hour and a half fucking playing that first mission trying to... I mean, I... Well, it was a perfect mission, but... <clears throat> um, I guess we'll see how much uh, difference it makes. Because... This time, I am not going to bother doing everything. I, you know, probably not. It just, it takes so long. To, you know, I was trying to look at everything and, you know, look at everything, scan everything, etc., etc. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the anyway, Starship Enterprise. It turns out that the fucking its volume mission was so loud. To explore on strange the game. new worlds. To discover and new life and new civilizations. Not, you know, doing to boldly well go where no man has so gone before. You couldn't hear anything I was saying, basically. It's covered up by the... <sighs> so this is going to have to be just a, a quick... A quick run through of this of this first mission. Uh, but we're we're learning. We're learning. Demon world. Though the Enterprise's primary mission is peaceful exploration, the galaxy holds many surprises. To be prepared, we are conducting a mock battle with the USS Republic. Ah, good. It remembered my fucking settings to not close these until I tell it to. Because by default, it doesn't do that. So you find it just, you know, going away rapidly. Ugh. Captain Patterson reports the Republic is in position and ready to begin, Captain. The Republic is arming weapons and raising shields. I suggest we do the same, Captain. Raising shields. Target analysis. Hard. Arming weapons. extends his congratulations, sir. Lowering shields and disarming weapons. Message coming in from Starfleet. On screen, Lieutenant. Jim, the Enterprise is ordered to travel to Pollux 5. The natives report that alien life forms have been attacking the settlers near a mine at Mount Idol. You are to report to the High Prelate of the Colony. The settlers are members of the Acolytes of the Stars sect. The description of the attackers vary, but all say that the attackers resemble creatures from many Earth religions known as demons. Starfleet wants you to determine the nature of these creatures and to resolve the situation without bringing harm to the colonists. Starfleet out. Pollux 5 system, an inhabited satellite of Pollux B. Pollux 5 has lately emerged from an ice age caused by large meteor strikes. It has recently been colonized by the acolytes of the star's religious sect. The planet is home to a wide variety of plant life, but insects and other lower life forms are the only known animals. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of my commentary from the first one, uh, I guess, is going to be lost because I don't remember precisely what I said, and uh, it's just not going to be quite the same. Not, you know, not saying it for the first time. Or to do things extemporaneously. 
Um, I do remember I, I commented on this, though. In the second game, they use Majel Barrett as the voice of the computer, which, yes, she was the, I think, the voice of the computer in the original series, but uh, that uh, the effects they used or whatever on her voice to make it sound artificial, I guess, or whatever, were really annoying, in my opinion. I never really cared for the way the computer sounded on the original series. Uh, and, of course, it's just it's just her voice, plain and simple, on The Next Generation, but I associate that with The Next Generation, so I don't really care for the fact that they used her in the second game for the voice of the computer with no effects or anything. I, I honestly prefer this woman and the effect they're using for her voice to do the computer thing. I, you know, I just... To me, it, it, it's more fitting. Wish, wish they'd had something similar on the original series itself. And I also made a comment that uh, that's our destination, which I probably remember that, you know, just from, uh, you know, <laughs> from playing the game so many times uh, for years. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the copy protection that they did on, on this thing, is if you don't own, if you didn't buy the game, if you just got, like, a copy of it or something, then you wouldn't have the, um, uh, manual or whatever that has the, uh, picture of the star chart and it tells you which, uh, stars are what, because it doesn't tell you in-game. So, you pick the wrong one at the, you know, at the wrong time, then no matter where the hell you're going, you'll run into enemies. You know, anywhere from one to, I think, as many as five enemy ships, either Klingons or Romulans or Lossy Pirates. And, uh, oh yeah, and I, I did mention something about how I played, you know, this opening part many, many times, practicing, you know, shooting down the Republic. And... Honestly, it seems like it used to be more difficult. <laughs> I'm not sure how that's possible. You know, most things that you play as, as a kid, you know, you find it's much more difficult later on because it's like, oh man, I got no skills. <laughs> yeah, I'm an old man now. I don't, I don't, I can't do this like I did when I was, when I was little. Um, but anyway, it seems like it was real easy here. Anyway, um, but, and usually if you're outnumbered, you know, you basically don't stand a fucking chance. But I do remember one time I managed to, I think, I think it was on the text, just the, you know, the old-fashioned diskette version of this. Um, I managed to find a lone Klingon battlecruiser going to the wrong system one time. So I saved that game so that I could play that over and over again, taking out that Klingon, um, uh, because it's pretty rare, like I said, to come across just one enemy and actually stand a chance against them. And all of the enemies can cloak, unlike, you know, Starfleet, you know, the Klingons, Romulans, and the Lossy Pirates all have cloaking devices. But in in this version of the game, the or, well, this version, in the um, in 25th Anniversary, not, not in Judgment Rights, they fixed that in Judgment Rights, but in 25th Anniversary, on an old-fashioned... Uh, CRT monitor with an easy uh, little knob for adjusting the contrast. You could turn that all the way up real quickly, and you'd be able to see the cloaked ships. <laughs> so that was a nice little exploit. We have arrived at Parts Five. And for some damn reason, the cursor always appears at the bottom of the view screen when you warp into a place, so you start spinning around. Entering standard orbit. Pollux 5 has recently emerged from an ice age, sir. It's spring at the moment, cool but tolerable. Sensors indicate previously documented flora and fauna. Nothing unusual. Message from High Prelate Robert Angevin, sir. Welcome, Enterprise. The High Prelate awaits you. Please, beam down and meet with him. Oh yes, and another thing that I made a comment about before, 
The transporter sound effect in this and 25th anniversary, I believe, is the same one from the original series. And in Judgment Rights, I believe they change it to be the transporter sound effect from Star Trek The Motion Picture, which was not at all a welcome change as far as I was concerned. I, I don't, you know, didn't care for that at all. Spock, come with me. Mr. Scott, you have the car. This is so much better, gentlefolk. We are honored at your presence and hope you will find peace here in our haven. And also another thing that I mentioned before, um, I don't know if maybe it was from the uh, diskette version and therefore, you know, didn't have the, you know, it was the one without the voiceovers. And so maybe it's just missing in, in the voiceover version. Um... But I could just about swear when I was a kid and played this game for the first time that there was a bit of dialogue where McCoy talks about the transporter landing him in a snowdrift. And then Spock responds with something along the lines of, A centimeter of snow hardly constitutes a drift, Doctor. Anyway, uh, I don't know. I missed that bit of dialogue. <laughs> uh, uh. Captain, the floor on this planet is very interesting. I wonder oh. how useful it may be for medicinal purposes. There's a clue, and as I mentioned in the previous playthrough, which was, you know, couldn't understand anything I was saying, um, uh, this particular mission is pretty fucking good at giving you clues as to what you're supposed to do in the dialogue. And I think the next one is two, and then the one after that, sort of, but not nearly as good. And it, just, I guess maybe they're supposed to be increasing difficulty or whatever, but it's like, without a lot of clues as to what you're supposed to do in these, a bunch of these missions are, are you know, basically unsolvable. It's like, what the, you know, what am I supposed to do? You just randomly do shit until you figure it out. Uh, it can become tedious very quickly. Alright. Uh. I've never seen snow like this before. This is great. You mean you've never built a snowman, Ensign? I've never even thrown a snowball. Do you think anyone would mind? Well, later, Ensign, we have work to do. Of course, sir. Captain, the demons and supernatural creatures are almost by definition illogical. Yet it is evident these people believe what they have seen. Barring illness or mass hysteria, I agree that a real problem seems to exist. Doctor, you need to investigate the possibility of disease, mental or physical, among these people before we go chasing up the mountains. Prelate and Given, may we see those who have encountered the demons? They are already gathered in the chapel, and will cooperate in any way with you, first door on my right. This planet's as beautiful as everyone says it is. The trees, the fresh air, the freezing cold. Come on, Bones, the cold will improve your circulation. Some people get too much circulation. And that's as close as you get to the conversation, I don't recall, being there. <clears throat> I don't know if the problem is real, the result of a new illness, or mass hysteria. But at the very least, there's an injured miner who needs my help. I'm Captain James T. Kirk of the USS Enterprise. We have received word that alien life forms are creating problems at your mining facilities at Idle Mountain. Tell me more. Certainly, Captain Kirk. Not aliens per se. We have encountered what we believe are demons at Idle Mountain. Creatures surely emerging from the very gates of hell. Our god would not test us thus without reason. So we believe your might and insight are our god's method to help us discover what is going on. Now, which god would that be, by the way? Aside from seeing demons, has any hard data been collected? Any evidence I could see? A skeptic would consider everything merely anecdotal or unproven. My people will gladly tell you their own stories, so you need not hear it secondhand through me. Hmm. 
What can you tell me about the mine itself? The area is exceptionally stable tectonically, and easy for our machinery to work in, praise God. We've mined for hafnium and a variety of useful trace elements. The deeper we dig, however, the more anomalous the variety of minerals seems to be. Our Ignatiate brother Stephen has his own theories about why this might be. Either way, the anomalies inspired brother Canbury to conduct studies inside the mine. Yesterday, he reported discovering a strange door. A gate to hell, surely, for the demons caused a cave-in immediately. Canbury was trapped, unconscious, and the demons prevent us from rescuing him. We can only hope he is still alive. Thank you for your courtesy, Kirk. May you receive the guidance and protection of our God as you complete this divine mission. Anyway, I believe that I did uh, also make that... Uh... A quickly constructed Spartan shelter, primarily used by fledgling colonies. <clears throat> I believe I did make that criticism in, in the previous attempt at recording. Uh, that in sci-fi, kind of a pet peeve of mine, um, religion is almost always either shown to be a negative thing, or if it's shown, like here, to be positive or at least neutral, it's always extremely vague. You know, it's like we, we don't want to, we don't want to get too much into, into what anybody believes or, you know, or who they believe in. We certainly don't want to say the name Jesus. <laughs> My Uncle John lived with the Acolytes a long time ago. He died in their service helping plague victims on New Ontario 6 20 years ago. The Acolytes did a lot of good work for the needy in this quadrant. Hmm, let's hope New Ontario is not as bad as the current Ontario, which is turning into a police state, isn't it, right now? It will be good to help them for a change. The medical methods of these people seem primitive to me, Doctor. By our standards, yes. Here the acolytes prefer a simpler lifestyle. Unfortunately, this is one of the consequences. Just thinking to myself, don't mind me. <laughs> okay. He is too busy consoling the wounded man. He is too busy consoling the wounded man. This man needs help, Jim. And I wouldn't want to put it off for too long. Pretty sure it's not actually timed in any way. This man is in no condition to talk. And yet... You'll understand if I don't stand up, I hope. I am not well. He does talk if you look at him. A majestic view of Mount Idol can be seen through the skylight. It does look majestic. Surprisingly so, for being so extremely low resolution. Uh, I detect various pieces of mining equipment, but nothing of note. I am worried about Brother Chubb. Can you examine him, Doctor? I believe I also mentioned last time that um, I hope that this word wasn't used the way it is now at the time that they made this game. <laughs> I'm assuming not, but, you know. <clears throat> uh, and I believe I also made a comment about uh, about the mountain reminding me somehow of, uh, despite, you know, the fact that there was no snow when we went to New Mexico. Uh, during the, yeah, it would have been during the summer. Uh, did hike up a uh, an extinct volcano one time collected uh, a few rocks. It was pleasant. Actually, I think, if I remember correctly, that uh, at the time we did have a laptop with us, which uh, did manage, you know, like Windows 95 laptop, but, uh, you know, uh, Windows 9X uh, versions were all built on DOS. So they still had DOS in the background, which meant they would still appropriately run most DOS programs. 
Uh, so anyway, I had Windows 95 laptop with us, and I believe I had this game installed, and um, one of the later missions in this game, you go to a moon with uh, sort of, you know, I don't know how to describe it, you know, sand. <laughs> like, it looks like, you know, sandy sort of rocks or something, I don't know. It's like, um, I'll mention it when we get there, I guess. <laughs> but, it's like, the, 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 something about it just made me, you know, about the, the way the rocks look in that mission made me think of, uh, you know, it's it's like it was the same thing as uh, as the seem similar to the to the rocks uh, on that extinct volcano. Similar color, similar mm, texture. Not really. Te I mean, how much texture can you get? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, there's just something about it that just you know seemed to mesh really well for me, and I thought, oh man, this is so cool. It's it's almost like we're walking on that <laughs> on that alien moon. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, use my coil. Jim, this man has suffered severe physical injuries to his head and arm. The wounds have been adequately cared for. However, he has developed a new Garian infection. If not treated swiftly, the effects can be fatal. The infection can normally be treated with hypoditoxin, but there's none on the Enterprise. I may be of some assistance. The Lorexian berry grows near the mouth of the cave. If I could acquire it, I would be able to synthesize the hypoditoxin from the berry. Unfortunately, the demons prevent us from approaching the cave entrance. Perhaps you could retrieve it for me. Then the high prelate has disappeared. Oh, that's another difference between this one. You notice there for a second. Uh, I noticed there for a second I, I attempted to click uh, to go forward, you know, to go to the next screen, this one, and it nothing happened. But the cursor was still the same in the next game in uh, Judgment Rights, the sequel to this. Uh, they change that so that you've got a little hourglass while the characters are moving or whatever. Which, to be honest, I kind of find that annoying because I don't know. I don't know that it takes any longer for the animation to play out and you be able to actually click on something. But somehow it feels like it's taking longer because you're sitting there looking at that fucking hourglass. That means you can't do anything yet. And so I just, I just really find it annoying. It's like, eh, I don't, I don't like this. <laughs> I just, let's, uh. You see a small explosion. Apparently, your Klingon's you're hand to, falls to the ground with a dull thud. Apparently, the ensign is supposed to get stunned or whatever because. I think. I don't know. It, it seems like as a kid I actually did uh, manage one time to click on each one of them fast enough to get them all shot before they shot the ensign. Captain, we registered phaser fire and an unknown energy beam. Is everyone okay? We're fine. Did you register any disruptor fire? No, Captain. Why? Are there Klingons down there? Why would it be Klingons instead of Romulans? They both use disruptors. No, just an idea, Kirk out. Fascinating. I begin to suspect that we have stumbled upon something that the colonists would never have uncovered. What is it, Spot? I wish to gather further data before making a definite conclusion, Captain. I guess this isn't such a great planet after all. Well, we've seen Klingons. Now all we need is a few Romulans. Control your thoughts, Doctor. There is a high probability that something here is using our own memories against us. We were caught flat-footed there. I don't want any more surprises to catch us off guard. 
Captain, I detect a recent avalanche, approximately 6.2 kilometers away, that occurred within the last three days. The mountain may be quite dangerous. Demons, Klingons, avalanches. What's next? The Wicked Witch of the West? That is not logical, Doctor. It wasn't supposed to be logical, you green-blooded falcon. Why does everything have to be so damn logical? Nothing to report, Captain. Gindorian ferns are regarded as an intergalactic weed, Captain. The Branzite pod is similar to Terran milkweed, except that the silk pods are in bright iridescent colors. Doctus cattails are similar to their Terran namesake, except that they are known to cause hives if in contact with flesh for any amount of time. Oh, too bad we can't rub them against people. Cartelian tulips are a perennial flower that survive in almost any climate. Oh yes, and I believe I mentioned that the use of intergalactic is nothing to report. Often uh, incorrectly employed in science fiction. Star Trek or Star Wars have stories that almost entirely occur within a single galaxy and yet they're always referring to something as being intergalactic and it's like it's not no it's galactic or intragalactic it is not intergalactic very few sci-fi franchises actually have things that commonly take place between different galaxies two examples uh, being Stargate and uh, primarily Stargate Atlantis and uh, well and and SG one just in the later seasons, and uh, Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda. This is not a Klingon captain, not a real one. It is an organic construct, an android-like robot. It looks like a Klingon, but the appearance is entirely superficial. Hmm. You take the Klingon's detached hand. It's not easy to see things at such low resolution. You know, to see details and try to figure out what the hell you're supposed to do. Pretty sure I missed that the first time. First, I don't remember whether the diskette version of the game even actually included the text saying that you see the Klingon's hand fall to the ground or whatever. Um... And I also don't, despite the fact that you can actually hear water, I don't think that I realize that uh, that this over here is a stream. <laughs> Since there's nothing animated about it. Of course, the only thing animated is the characters. The you know, background is static. Which also, the background is, strangely enough, uh, not always the same size. Look at all that black area. You know. Fecodine moss extracts nourishment from hafnium, Captain. Interesting. How does it do that? These seem to be Laraxian berries, Captain. They have several medicinal uses, but Dr. McCoy would know more. The answer to this mystery lies ahead of us, gentlemen. And yet we're going back. Whoever was trying to stop us may not stop with those Klingons, Captain. I recommend extreme caution. The thought had occurred to me, Mr. Spock, but thank you for mentioning it. I'm sorry I let you down with those Klingons back there. I should have been paying more attention. Just don't make that mistake again, Ensign. Those Klingons give yes. me the willies. They always have. My sister was wounded by them in the Chozon ambush. We've all had our share of conflict with the Klingons, Ensign. The Organians told me that one day, humans and Klingons will become good friends. I wonder if I'll ever live to see that day. Interesting, since uh, this game, I guess, would have been after Does Star your tricorder say the cave is warmer, Spock? It is not logical for me to use my tricorder to determine the cave's temperature, Doctor. I do not see what purpose it would serve. 
Uh, well, I should think that there are some purposes to it. Spock, everybody talks about the weather. Jim, these are the berries we need to synthesize the hypodetoxin. We must get these to Brother Stephen quickly. You have retrieved a sample of berries. Good! You have found the berries! Uh, bring them to my lab, quickly. Which presumably is this structure, since it's the only other one there. Fascinating, Captain. It is an RDAC-4 molecular synthesizer, a museum piece in perfect working order. I read a collection of small items of no evident value. I would characterize this as a small museum display, Captain. Nothing to report. Residue of several different compounds are in the tubes. None of the compounds would explain the sightings. Not a meth lab. Got it. A vintage 801286 of the mid 21st century. It is a fine museum piece. The 801286. So, this is supposed to be, you know, an evolution of, of modern PCs. Except it's a CRT, I guess. Well, I don't get it. It doesn't have to be. It could be a flat panel display and then. Just the inner workings of the computer or behind it or something. Although it shouldn't take up that much room. So probably it's just meant to be our CRT display. Uh, yeah, I believe I mentioned something about how some people try to say that uh, Star Trek predicted cell phones or at least flip phones or whatever because of the communicator, and it's like, not really, because that's an antenna that's being flipped out there, and cell phones are networked communications, and those appear to work just like walkie-talkies, which were commonplace in the 60s. So, anyway. The settings on the Ardac 4 have already been adjusted. Now simply place the berry in the machine, and the hypoditoxin will be synthesized. The machine synthesizes a quantity of hypoditoxin. We've got to get this to Brother Chubb as quickly as possible, Jim. Thank you. You're most kind. Brother Candre was, or is, my partner. I was on the communications link when the demons caused the rockfall and silenced him. He said he'd found a strange door with devilish writing. Truly, he came upon the gate of hell itself. And of course, once, once you've seen... Uh... <laughs> Father Ted, you're probably likely to to think this is my partner. <laughs> Not my sexual partner! <laughs> uh. I am Brother Grisnash. I went up the mountainside in solitary prayer seeking to face my fears. Indeed, I found them. A bellowing krognik demon with sharp teeth and a long snout descended upon me in a rush of wind. Captain, a krognik demon has a decidedly wolfish appearance. Brother Grisnash, is this not the traditional shape of the evil one and his minions among Tellarites? Makes sense, as Tellarites are 
pig creatures that they would be afraid of the big bad wolf. It is. I believe this may be significant, Captain. Then that's all we say about it. I headed up the party that sought to rescue Brother Candry. Without warning, the demons appeared and attacked us as we approached the mine. Can you tell us what they look like? Like the demons that have plagued devout folk since before our people left the earth. Huge, muscular demons with ruddy skin, truly the manifestation of evil, with bat wings, horns and talons, and a pointed tail. God preserve us all. One tore open my arm and I surely would have perished, but for my companions who bore me back down the mountain. The demons didn't follow you? No. This is the chapel. And yet it, there's nothing here but mining equipment. <laughs> is there more, you know, to it that we're not allowed to explore or, you know, is that I don't know. I am Brother Stephen, an Ignatiate following the holy teachings with mind and soul alike. I believe the anomalous mineral readings in combination with evidence of ancient disturbances in this otherwise highly stable geologic location indicates previous habitation of the region eons ago. Why, Spock, you two should get along fine. He sounds just like you. I would be equally honored to discuss medicine with you, Doctor, as science with your Vulcan associate. Let me continue. I Not believe our be god made humans, medicine aliens, and, and demons all. If I could get a real demon into my study, I would bless our god for the opportunity, as I thank him for everything in this life. You tread close to unholy knowledge, Brother Stephen. I appreciate your prayers, Brother Roberts. Uh, Captain, if you and your people go up the mountain, I hope afterward you will visit me in my study, which is next door. I'm too old to make the trek myself, but I'm eager for knowledge. In return, I will offer you what insights our God grants these old eyes. Brother Roberts. Did he, uh, did he invent Wing Commander? What an interesting artifact. Hmm, it appears to have been damaged. But when you have a chance, take it to my lab and we'll see if it can be repaired. I wonder if any of this stuff might be useful. Well, what happens next? This place looks real comfortable. A place to combine work, contemplation. Man's got an eye for the beauty of useful things, and for the use of beautiful things. I think we could get along fine. <clears throat> this study represents a man with a keen mind, Captain. To judge by what I see, there is little which does not interest him. The equipment is antiquated, but practical. I never dreamed that Starfleet would be interested in my discoveries, Captain. But our god often surprises us. What a fascinating piece of equipment. Highly advanced technology. You see here, it seems to have been damaged, however. Take it to my workbench and let's see if it can be repaired. I fear my hands are too shaky to perform such fine work, but perhaps one of you can do it. Mr. Spock, see what you can do about that hat. This machinery is delicate, but I have managed to repair the circuitry. Mr. Spock, see what you can dig up from that old-fashioned computer terminal. Captain, this appears to be a model of the Earth. Notice how it models the proper situation for a total eclipse. Another clue. You are interested in my little museum of curiosities? Looks like a pile of junk if you ask me. Yes, tell us about these things. I enjoy talking about these treasures. 
Shall I go into mineral specimens? True curiosities, nothing more. I think they're very pretty, don't you? Shall I go into mineral specimens? Meteorite. I believe this is evidence of the cataclysm which destroyed the moon of Pollux five eons past. I've constructed a theoretical model based on analysis of the planet's <sighs> rings of what things might have been like. I think that the moon, like Earth's moon, would have made a total eclipse of the sun possible. I would have liked to have seen There's that. There's a sign there somewhere. Conditions making a perfect total eclipse are rare in the universe. Our God creates are great they? wonders. Rare in the whole universe? Wow. Oh. Shall I go into mineral meteor fossil shell, one of the oldest forms I've seen on this planet? Our God makes beautiful things indeed. Shall I go into mineral meteor fossil skull of a small alien animal? The skull of a modern Silati, the largest creature native to this planet, yeah, about the size of a house cat from Earth. The Salatis combine a rather insectoid pattern with four-legged reptilian form, including praying mantis-like forelimbs. Shall I go into mineral specimen? Fossil chef skull, a twist of metal. This chunk of rock is a greatly weathered example of a vanadium tungsten alloy, which doesn't occur naturally. It is my best evidence that the area was previously inhabited. I know tungsten's a real thing, but I don't know offhand about vanadium. Shall I go into mineral specimen? Meteor fossil shell skull of a small twist of more? Would you rather move on to something else? Very well. I can't imagine why, but if you have a further interest in any of this, take what you like. But please remember to return my treasures when you're done with them. If you tell him there's a pile of junk, he doesn't let you, uh, doesn't tell you that you can take what you like. Which makes me wonder if that happens, is there a way to break into it, or... Fossil shells in limestone substrate, compatible with local geologic features. A completely ordinary nickel-iron meteorite. A variety of rock specimens, including native silver, azurite, crystalline forms of various minerals. A sample of a local life form called a salati, the largest animal reported on this planet. About the size of an Earth house cat, the Salatis have an insectoid reptilian genotype with praying mantis-like forelimbs. A manufactured vanadium tungsten alloy of considerable age and indeterminate use. The old man carefully returns the items to his cabinet. Bless you for returning my things. The old man carefully... Bless you for returning my things. The old man carefully returns the items to his cabinet. Bless you for returning my things.
Jim, the next time you need medical help on a snowball... Bones. I'll probably end up coming along. A gateway to an alien race. The wonders of the galaxy are endless, aren't they, Mr. Spock? Indeed, Captain. They can also be damn cold. No sign of demons, Klingons, or other hostiles, Captain. I promise I'll let you know the instant something appears. Don't be too anxious, Ensign. We may want to talk with them. I recommend as thorough an analysis of this area as possible. Captain, there are several weak points in the cave-in's structure. Careful use of our phasers from the top down should be able to clear it. Fascinating, Captain. This door is made of an unknown material. It is clearly built by an alien race we have no knowledge of. Fascinating. I'm registering low-intensity shielding unlike anything we've encountered before. That kept this door, and whatever is behind it, hidden from the ship's sensors and earlier tricorder readings. I'm picking up weak vital signs. If we don't dig him out soon, we're going to lose him. Captain, the structure is extremely unstable. I would not recommend disturbing the lower section before the upper sections have been cleared. Assume firing positions. Uh, when I was a kid and I played this for the first time, the diskette version without any voiceovers, I misread that at first as awesome firing positions. And I, <laughs> I thought Kirk was being sarcastic. Uh. Oops. He's dead, Jim. Why would you want to do that? Let's not go misusing a medical kit, Jim. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim. Ensign Everts is beyond my help. Ah, <sighs> okay. Well, we've demonstrated that. A huge boulder sits upon a large pile of rubble. Assume firing positions. This man is badly hurt and suffering from shock and exposure as well. It was a near thing, but he'll live. This looks like some of the hand security panels on the Enterprise. It appears to be a security lock designed to open the door when the correct handprint is registered. See what I mean about clues? Plenty of clues. You know, even as a kid, real fucking easy to understand what you're supposed to do. Oh, thank you, kind souls, for saving my life. Let me rest here for a little before returning to report this miracle to Prelate Angiven. Good luck finding him. He just seemed to vanish. <laughs> And circuitry triggers a connection and the door opens.
This is a very old and very complex life support system. It appears to still be operational. It is an alien life support system, Captain, utilizing geothermal energy. It is still functioning, waiting for some sort of signal. Fascinating, Captain. It is a diagram of a lunar eclipse of this planet. See how the red sphere of the moon is casting a shadow on the blue sphere, Pollux 5. This must be a very old piece of work, because this planet's moon was destroyed thousands of years ago. Thousands. Not exactly eons, but eons is often used figuratively, so... The machinery is waiting for the gravitational pull of another eclipse to activate it. An eclipse that will never come. And one other thing, Captain. This may also be a diagram showing the proper settings on that control panel. This control panel is a manual override for the alien life support equipment. This alien construction takes readings of mental activity. It also activates manufacturing equipment related to security and includes a short distance transportation device. I'm just a security officer, sir. Logically, the machinery is sustaining some type of life in suspended animation. If we can reactivate the machines, then we may be able to meet its creators. I wonder who or what constructed all this. I think we found the answer to our mystery. Hmm. for repairing our somnambutron. It looks kind of like um, what some uh, some TV program or other that I watched, I think hosted by Christopher Reeve about dinosaurs or whatever, uh, suggested, you know, you know, I watched when I was quite, quite young, um, suggested that uh, dinosaurs could have evolved into if they'd still been around. Which seems a bit of a stretch that they would evolve into something humanoid, but whatever. <sighs> also, if you uh, if you make the wrong choices... Stop! You're trespassing on Federation like territory. Like that one, and then you try to attack him with your phaser or whatever. Uh, a wide beam shoots out from the top of that and vaporizes all of you. <laughs> I welcome you on behalf of the United Federation of Planets. Who are you? Where you come from? We did fix your machine. Can we write the repair bill off against rent on this land? <laughs> I welcome you on behalf... We call ourselves Nauians. Thousands of years ago, we saw that meteor impacts were going to cause an ice age. We created this huge underground shelter to preserve our race, keeping us in suspended animation until the planet had recovered. We programmed the machinery to revive us at the next eclipse, but we did not count on the destruction of our moon. Some advanced civilization. Perhaps you can tell us about the demons. The demons, as you call them, are created by a machine designed to keep intruders away from our sleep chambers. It pulls from the minds of any approaching creature their most feared enemy and produces replicas to scare them away. For you and your crew, it was Klingons. For the Tannerai, it's a wolf demon. And for the other humans, a demon from their religion. On behalf of my people, thank you for waking us. I will turn off the machinery which creates our guardians, so that they no longer bedevil those with whom we now share our home. Now, how exactly does he know all these details? Yeah. Oh, whoa! But he just woke up. Alas! The key is missing. I can do nothing. Even we will suffer the attacks of our own guardians unless the key can be found. I implore you, if you can help, please do so. Jim, think about that skull we picked up from Brother Stephen. 
Now look at this alien. See the resemblance? A child? No, I see many differences. This must be what our people who did not slumber have become. Still, I would like to see these remains properly interred according to the precepts of our religion. May I keep this? Slightly surprising that they're religious. Of course, I think I think I should return it to where I got it from. No, I want to keep it as a memento for myself. <laughs> of course, I think you will get along well with the Pollux inhabitants, and I'm sure you will have interesting theological discussions. You found the key. I can now turn off the machinery creating our guardians, and no more sentience shall be Sapience. at risk. Surely the Holy One smiles upon us all. I have no way to thank you, Captain. But please carry this request from my people to yours. We have much ancient knowledge we can share, and we would like to join your Federation. Go in peace. Uh, yeah, once again, this is something that sci-fi gets wrong. Sentient simply means, you know, able to sense, you know, with, you know, sight, sound, touch, whatnot. Uh, and sapient refers to wisdom, which is, you know, mm, some people might debate that, but <laughs> all it really means is a higher order of intelligence. So humans are sapient, but, you know, cats, dogs, whatever, are all sentient. But sci-fi always refers to higher order intelligence, life forms like humans and Vulcans and whatever the fuck else as being sentient. It's like, well, yes, they are sentient, but that's not the distinction. The distinction is they are sapient. <laughs> uh, not sure uh, how that uh, confusion came about, but it's, it's not something that... Uh, People get disabused of easily. I will be glad to accept your application to the Federation. We shall have a diplomatic envoy sent to make the final arrangements. We look forward to meeting them. We also look forward to having discourse with the colonists. Farewell. May the Holy One bless you. <laughs> and also, as a kid playing this, the, the text-only version, diskette version, I believe the first time that I got this far, I may have misread uh, discourse as intercourse. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, the the fun of of being mildly dyslexic, I guess. That's, you know, that's like discourse for the you know, uh, yeah, makes perfect sense. You read it the first time, and it's like intercourse with wait, wait, what, what? Uh, what kind of game is this? <laughs> Bought something by mistake. Live long and prosper. You know, it's funny. As a kid, I didn't used to could do the whole live long and prosper thing. You know, the the you know the the split fingers thing. And uh, I remember I remember tricking somebody one time. You know, into thinking that I could do it. I taped my fingers together, <laughs> and there and you know, and she was like. Oh wow, you can do that, you know. And I was like, yeah, you know. Then she looked closer, saw the tape, and she's like, oh, you know. Uh, but as an adult, it, you know, one of the few things that that seems to have improved over time, instead of you know just getting old and decrepit, uh, as an adult, I have absolutely no problem whatsoever with with doing the Vulcan salute with either hand. I I don't know. Weird. Kirk to Enterprise. Beam us up, Mister Scott. Why is there some blue in his hair there? Message from Starfleet. On screen, Lieutenant. We have read your report on the problems at Pollux 5 and evaluate your performance at 100%. You and your crew received four commendation points. And, and the second game, I believe she's named Admiral Kane. 
Um, I don't, I don't, obviously, that's not after uh, Admiral Kane, the female Admiral Kane, anyway. Yeah, for the, the reimagined Battlestar Galactica, because uh, that would have been an, another ten years off at least. When Judgment Rights came out. Anyway, um, at the end of this game, there is a final battle with three enemy ships. Not a very Star Trek way to end things, I might add, although the nice little speech that you get from William Shatner afterwards, uh, giving a nod to Gene Roddenberry, uh, is quite nice. And although the mission at the end of Judgment Rights is very Star Trek esque, um, the fact that it just kind of goes to credits and there's just nothing. It just sits there in this endless loop of stars and music, I guess, until you, you know, press a key to continue, and then that's, that's it. So that's kind of disappointing. Anyway, but in order to win this battle, I think, I don't know, I, you know, playing it years ago, uh, I never seemed to be able to win that battle, and many other people have reported the same. But uh, I've seen somebody on YouTube do it almost effortlessly. And I can only assume that it must have something to do with how many commendation points you receive. And if you get the mission perfect 100%, you get four each time. But if you do, you know, like I often did 97%, that only gets you three. So, I don't know. I guess your performance at the end in that battle may be linked to how many commendation points you have racked up. I'm not sure. But, uh, I don't know. I think it plays the the end credits and, and William Shatner's uh, closing narration either way, whether you get blown up or not. <laughs> so, I guess you can at least see that part. <sighs> A perfect mission, Jim. You are a model for all Starfleet. I might have known there weren't any demons. We all have demons of our own bones. The ones we can't confront are often the hardest to deal with. These demons were based on fear, Captain. A human failing. I don't know, Spock. Everything that I've ever read about demons describes them as having pointy ears. I feel like that's a callback to one particular episode where they have some similar such discussion, but I don't remember which one offhand. Uh, don't remember if I've said it yet or not, but another difference captain. between the first game and the second game, the sequel Judgment Rights, is in this one, McCoy, or DeForest Kelly, is uh, reading the names of the episode, uh, you know, and, or you know, the name of the mission, and in the second one, he does not. Um... Uh, And I also don't care for the fact that you go from immediately from, you know, what people are, you know, from the dialogue people are saying in the, in one mission to the entrance and then immediately people are talking in the next one and it's like you don't get a chance to save before the mission briefing, basically, <laughs> of what you're supposed to be doing this time around. On screen, Lieutenant. The USS Enterprise is to report immediately to Beta Myamid. The USS Masada has failed to report as scheduled. Determine nature of delay and take whatever measures are necessary. Set course for Beta Myamid, sir? Uh, no. No, we are quitting. But anyway. So there we go, that was the first mission. Of is there seven? I think there's seven missions, maybe? I can't remember. Seven or eight. I think it's seven. Alright. Let's see if this recording did any better than the last one, because the last one fucking you know, it's almost an hour and forty minutes that it took for me to do all of the little things, you know, to try to make sure that I got a perfect score and then and also, you know, make commentary and whatnot and then find out that oh, you can't hear a fucking word that I'm saying. 
because you know it's still recording my my voice too low and there's way too much you know massive amount of sound coming from the game I, you know I, I actually I had to turn turn that down uh, because it's just I mean I should have known it was gonna be too loud oh well until the next one yes quit the game yes that's why I clicked on that <laughs>